In this video, we will be looking at parametric graphing and how we can efficiently use our CX CAS to work on parametric graphing questions. To start with, we have example one. State the Cartesian equation of the ellipse defined by the parametric equations x equals 2 plus 3 cos t and y equals 3 plus 2 sine t. Verify this using the graphs application. Okay, so to get started on this question, I'm simply going to type in the equation that we saw, which is x equals 2 plus 3, and then we press the trig button, press right to get to cos, enter, and then t, enter again. So we have the x equation entered in. Now let's do the same for the y equation. y equals 3 plus 2 trig sine and then t, enter. So now that we've got these two equations written in, um, we can see that we have cos and sine in both those equations, which means the Pythagorean identity would be perfect to use over here. The Pythagorean identity is cos squared plus sine squared equals 1. So in order to use the Pythagorean identity, we have to solve for cos and sine. So the x equation up here, the way I'm going to solve for cos is by creating a fraction, control divide, and then x minus 2 on the numerator divided by 3. So that's solving this equation for cos. And that, of course, just equals trig right arrow cos t, enter. There we go. So we've now got the expression that equals cos of t. In a similar fashion, we can do the same thing with sine. So y minus 3 all over 2 equals sine. So trig sine of t, enter. So here we go. We've now got cos and sine isolated by themselves. One little known feature of the, of the CAS is that we can square and add equations. So I'm going to use cos squared plus sine squared equals 1. Open a bracket, press up a few times to highlight the cos equation, press enter to, enter to copy and paste it in, close the bracket, square. So that's the cos squared part done. Now plus, open bracket, press up for the sine part, press enter, close bracket, square, and that, of course, e sorry, that doesn't equal 1. We just press enter on that, and now what the calculator has done is it squared the left-hand sides, added them together to give the left-hand side here, and then it's taken cos, squared that, taken sine, also squared that, and equated that to 1. We can now use uh, complete the square to convert it into the form we're used to. So to get to complete the square, menu, 3 for algebra, 5 for complete the square. Press up and enter to copy and paste, comma x, comma y for the variables, enter, and there we go. So there is the, the equation of the ellipse, which is x minus 2 all squared on 9, plus y minus 3 all squared on 4 is equal to 1. The second part of the question mentions that we have to verify this using the graphs application. So going to the graphs application, what we're first going to do is use the Cartesian form from before. In order to enter a Cartesian ellipse equation, we have to go to menu, three for graph entry, three for equation templates, four for ellipse, and then one for center form. So from the previous, um, previous page, which was 1.1, we saw that the equation of the ellipse was x minus 2 squared over 9. However, notice how the box is being squared over there. So we have to write 3. We don't write 9 over there. In a similar fashion, we go to the y, and we have y minus 3 all squared over 4, which is 2 squared, and that equals 1, and that is our ellipse. To verify that this ellipse is the same as that given by the parametric, we can now change our graph entry menu again. So menu, 3 for graph entry, for parametric. And now we're going to type in the parametrics from before. 2 plus 3 trig cos of cos of t for the x and 3 plus 2 trig sine of t for the y. Hit enter and as you can see 
The two graphs are pretty much coincidental. They are on top of each other. So we have now verified that the Cartesian equation, which was x minus 2 squared on 9 plus y minus 3 squared on 4 is equal to 1, is the same equation, which produces the same graph as the parametric equations from before. As you can see, there we are. That's the same graph there. Center at 2 comma 3, semi-major axis of 3, and a semi-minor axis of 2. OK, moving on to the second example. We've now got two, uh, two particles, two moving particles, and they have respective position vectors, which are given by R1t equals t plus 1i plus 4tj, and R2 of t is equal to 2t minus 2i plus t squared plus 3j where t is uh, zero and more. We have to find when and where the particles will collide. Okay, so to get this done, we're gonna to move to a new problem, 2.1, and let's now define the x and y components of each of the position vectors. So I'm gonna use x1, open bracket t. So x1 of t is the x component of particle one. Control template, which gives us the assign to command, and then t plus 1, which is the x value of r1 of t. Press enter, and now I'll repeat the procedure for y1 of t, and so, and so on and so forth. So y1 of t is defined as 4t. There we are. So that is particle 1 taken care of. What I can also do is also define the position vector as r1 of t. So r1 of t, I'll control template that, define that. Now let's open a vector bracket. So control open bracket, that's a bunch of square brackets. Press var x1 of t, comma, and the second component is y1 of t. Var down arrow to select y1 of t, enter. So there, we now have the position vector of r1t stored in our CAS. Now let's repeat the same for particle two. X two of t is defined as two t minus two. And then y two of t is defined as t squared plus three. Enter. And now let's repeat to select, uh, to define the position vector of particle two. So R2 open bracket T close bracket. Define that using a vector as before. Var, let's go down to X2 of T close bracket, comma, var Y2 of T. And there we go. Okay, so to find when and where the particles will collide, we need to make sure that they're at the same location at the same time. In order to solve for this, we simply have to go to menu, three for algebra, one for solve, and then we can equate the position vectors together. So solve R1 of T, close bracket, equals var again, R2 of T, close bracket, and we have to solve that for T, hit enter. And we get told that T equals three. Okay, so this, Using this method over here will only give you the t value or values at where the particles are at the same location at the same time. Just to quickly verify this fact, we'll let's sub in t equals three into both the position vectors. So var r1, let's type in three. Okay, so the particle is at four i comma or four i plus twelve j, or the coordinates four comma twelve. Let's repeat that for r2. Type in three and we see the same thing. So clearly, at t equals three, the particles are at the same position. But this just does not necessarily mean that their paths only cross at this point. It is possible that their paths also cross at another point or points. So to, to see physically what is happening, let's move to a graphing screen and type in the, the, the parametric equations of these particles. So I'm gonna change the 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 graph entry mode, menu, graph entry, and then parametric, which is four. So what we can see is that we are on X3. 
What that might um, imply is that there's something already in X1 and X2. So if you go back, you notice that X1 of T has already been defined as T plus 1 and 40, which is what we defined it before. However, given, given that this question has an unbounded T domain from 0 all the way to infinity, I think it's a good idea to just increase our T range, maybe up to something like 20. So I'll hit enter on that. And there we go. That's position, particle one's position vector or particle one's path being shown to us. I'm then going to press the tab button, then press up again to get to particle two and do the same thing. I'm going to modify the domain so that instead of 6.28, which was two pi, I'm going to change that to 20. Hit enter and there we go again. Okay, so we can see that you can't really see much going on over here. So let's change the window settings. So from our by hand working, we figured out that a good uh, domain setting would be to do this. Menu for window zoom and one for window settings. So I'm going to change my X min to negative two. My X max, I'll leave at 10. X scale might be good idea to put that at one. Y min, I'll leave that at negative two. And Y max, I'll put that somewhere about 40. And Y scale, let's say maybe about five. So the Y max, this, this graph uh, takes on quite large Y values and that's why the Y max is at 40. I'm gonna press okay and here we go. So what you can see is that uh, particle one, which is the straight line, follows a straight line path, of course. And particle two follows a parabolic path. Now what you can see at this point here, as well as the other point there, there are two points of intersection of the paths of these particles. However, only one of those corresponds to a collision. So going back to 2.1, we notice that the coordinate 4, 12 is the point of collision, which happens when t equals 3. So to show you why this is the case, let's go back to 2.2 and then use the trace command. So menu, 5 for trace, and one for graph trace. I'm simply going to type in three, which will force t to equal three, and hit enter. And what you can see is that at this point, particle one is at the point four comma twelve at t equals three. I can then press the down button, and you can see the exact same information, but now for particle two. Okay, so now we can change our t value. For example, I can keep pressing right until particle two is at that location. So particle two is at eight comma 28, which is the other intersection point when T equals five. Okay, what's happening at T equals five for particle one? Let's press up to find out. And what's happening is that particle one is at when T equals seven, when T equals seven, particle one is at eight comma 28. So clearly there are different times at when at which particle one and particle two are at eight comma twenty eight and therefore they do not collide at that point. Okay, so here again is the path. Moving on to our final example, which is example three. So the position vector of a particle at time t is given by R of T is equal to sine squared of T i minus two cos squared of T j for t values between and including zero and pi on two. The question says, the path along which the particle moves from zero negative two to one zero is, is it either straight, circular, elliptical, parabolic, or hyperbolic. So in order to answer this question, all we really need to do is go to a new problem, which is a new calculator page, and we can either use use the Pythagorean identity to, to, go, to understand the problem, or we can actually just use a graph. So I'm gonna use a graph initially, and then we'll use the Pythagorean identity later on. So as before, when you're using the graph application, you wanna use the, you wanna change the graph mode. So three for graph entry, four for parametric. So our x, our x um, function is trig sine t close bracket squared, so that's sine squared of t. The y function is negative two trig cos t close bracket squared. And we are given a domain of zero to pi on two. 
Let's go fix that up. So instead of 6.28, let's backspace all that and put pi, enter, divide by two. Okay, so what we can see here is this, this particle has basically moved along what appears to be a straight line. So look, given, given that that looks like a straight line, let's verify that on our calculator screen. So control left to go back to 3.1. We are told that X is equal to trig sine of T close bracket squared. So X is defined as sine squared of T. And Y is defined as negative two trig cos T close bracket and squared. Okay, so what we can do is we can take the most recent line and divide both sides by negative two. And the reason I've done that is because we know that sine squared plus cos squared must equal one. So what we can now see is that we've got an equation here, neg y on two equals cos of t squared, and x is equal to sine of sine of t all squared. So, equa so adding the left the left hand sides and adding the right hand sides will give this x plus negative fraction y over two. That should equal the sine squared plus cos squared. So sine t close bracket squared plus trig cos t close bracket squared. And let's see what happens. There we go. We get x minus y on two equals one. Clearly this is a linear equation and therefore it will give us a straight line. Just to be 100% certain, let's solve that for y. Menu three, one for solve, up, enter, comma, y, and there we go. Y equals two x minus two. That is clearly the equation of a straight line. So going back to our graph that we can verify now using algebra that that path is certainly a straight path. Therefore, the answer is A.